going to blow up on me. Okay, and uh, um, um, it's, uh, it's starting to whir around and, and do stuff like that. Our number is Great American Broadcast. We need your calls, folks, so where are you tonight? Uh, uh, you know, it's been, uh, it was kind of quiet last night. We only had like about four people. David? Yeah, I just want to say, Alex, that the largest lake in the world is Lake Baikal, Baikal in Russia. It, 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 oh, it is? Okay, hold on a second. I got to turn something off here. Oh, here, hold on a second. I got to turn the sound off on that. Okay, because the video is running now. So let me, for people who want to see uh, what's happening, uh, uh, Mark, we still don't have video on you. Um, I, I, oh, uh, wait a minute. Let me turn mine on. And let me accept you. And there, you we, there, there we, we go. There we go. Now we're all copacetic. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch to the screen so everybody can see the uh, um, great American, our, our little group here, our friendly, happy uh, little family. And let wow, me wow. check out that reel to reel up on Rob's stack. Oh, boy. Oh, yeah, that's a quadraphonic reel to reel. How about that? Oh, really? Wow. Yeah, that's a quad unit. Oh, really? Oh, son of a bitch. Now, let me see here. I'm trying to get this to go down. There we go. I'm trying to frame the picture so everything looks fine. And we'll get rid of that on the bottom. Come on. Go up. Oh, darn. It's having problems there. Oh, well. We'll leave it at that. There we go. I'm, I'm trying to frame the picture for everybody out there who's watching the TV. Okay, so we need more callers even at Great American Broadcast. Great American Broadcast. Where did we leave off last night? Boy, we have a, as somebody wrote on my uh, Facebook page, they really liked last night's show. Yep. Uh, because they, they lo love the talk about Frank Sinatra. And, oh, that's uh, part of the best of this weekend. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is it really? And, and you know, Alex, it's funny because one of the few box sets I have Mm -hmm. is Sinatra's work for film music. And to me, that's his most, personally, for me, that's his most, in, to me, personally, interesting. What do you mean his most, yeah. it, like, you mean things like On the Town and uh, yeah, High Society? High Society. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, I always liked his stuff, his music for movies. And there was this great box set that came out, um, even with some rarities, on it that I never even knew existed. So that was a lot of fun, you yeah. know? Did anybody ever see Sinatra perform live? Yeah, I saw, I mentioned last night, I saw Sinatra perform live. What year did you see him? When, uh, not a good year. Uh, <laughs> in, in fact, it was a bad night for him because Jilly had just died that oh. day. I oh. was supposed to meet him. Uh, oh, wow. the, uh, I had a comedian I knew who was opening for him and he said, come on down, we'll get you a good seat, and I'll introduce you to Frank. And I went, this is my chance to meet Frank Sinatra. And then Jilly died, and they said, he doesn't want to talk to anybody. Aww. And then he went out and sang, and he was. this was at the time when he was starting to lose his powers. And um, it was pretty sad, actually. Um, and at one I point... Saw him I saw him in uh, at Radio City Music Hall in '92, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, he he was definitely a, a shell of himself. But yes. I was still in awe, yeah. you know, because he still had that stage presence. It was still Sinatra. Well, what, what year and, was know, this? What year was this? '92. Oh wow, that was this was later than I when I did it. Well, maybe maybe that was about mm -hmm. when I did it. Good night, dear. Let's see. She you know, it's the it's this it's the persona. He yeah. came on and and uh, you know he lights the cigarette and he has the drink in his hand and he's you know he sings the song. Well, um, I mentioned last know, night quarter to three. Yeah, well, I mentioned that. Uh, well, a couple, uh, last night I was mentioning that that when he put his cigarette out on the stage, he he missed it and didn't actually put it out. And halfway through the next song, Frank Jr. had to say, "Dad, the stage is on fire." <laughs> and then there's Sinatra stomping the stage out, you know, the fire out on the stage. And uh, it was uh, pretty pathetic. Uh, yeah, he and, forgot the words to the songs. Well, you know, no, but he here's joked the, about he, it. Well, here's the thing. Okay. I'm, I'm watching him. I'm like in the third row. And he's wow. singing and staring at me. And I can't figure out why he's staring at me. And then I, sud I suddenly figured it out. He was reading the lyrics to the songs off a teleprompter. 
So now he, it was a Circle Star Theater, and it was a circular stage, so there was a monitor in every, uh, you know, 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 9 o'clock, right? So I could look over at one of the other monitors, and he'd be singing, he'd say, she gets too hungry for dinner at 8, Jack. And they wrote the Jack in. <laughs> That's how far gone Frank was. Yeah. So I got him late in his career. Well, I got him later, obviously. I loved it. Believe me, I enjoyed the show just because I knew I was staring at a legend, you know. Yeah. And I, and I like you, went through a period, uh, and it was – so it was in the late 80s, 89, 90. I went through a period where I just – all I listened to was Frank. Really? And, yeah. I saw. Yeah. I, I, oh, well, that's you know, what I did. That's what I, that's what I did. Uh, uh, what was it? Uh, somebody was nice enough to give me everything Frank Sinatra ever recorded, okay, as a gift. And uh, I put it all on my uh, iPod. And I listened continually for the better part of a year to nothing but Frank Sinatra. Yeah, yeah. And never got tired of it, you know. And Neither it got, did I, yeah. It, it got to the point that I could tell by how well he was singing or not singing as to how old he had gotten. Hi, Josh Wheeler. How are you? I'm all right. How you doing? Okay, you sound tired. I'm a little upset. Hey, Josh. I'm, uh... Huh? <laughs> You're what? I said I'm a little upset, but I'm all right. What are you upset about? Anything? All games over, and they didn't fucking win. So. Oh boy, we're we gonna oh, have to put up mood. with it. We're gonna have to put up with this all season long from you. But oh god, I feel like crap tonight. Why? My team lost. Oh look, he's wearing a Reds T-shirt. I bet it was the Reds who lost. Yeah. 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 Anyway, where were we? Oh, I, we were talking for a second about Frank Sinatra here. But uh, I listened to everything that he recorded to the point where I could tell you where in his career a particular song was done by how much power he had at that point or how he was singing it. And, uh, man, there's just, as I said last night, there is this sweet spot that started about 50... <laughs> <clears throat> three and went to about 70 where he was just at the top of his game you know uh, what do, what did you think um, uh, Rob uh, I know you you're turned away from the camera but uh, I'm trying to find the my favorite I have all my music right back here I was trying to find my favorite Sinatra album to show you it's because I I think it's called it might as well be swing yeah that was with be... Nelson Riddle and fly me to the moon is the first track and uh, it's my favorite Sinatra album, and I don't know what year that was recorded. It's I, Nelson that, Riddle. That was early on in the Capitol years, wasn't it? I, I, that's right. No. I was just going to go grab it to see if I'll I tell can you. Get you know, idea. everybody talks about how uh, Frank Sinatra was. Uh, you know how his uh, his best work was done with Nelson Riddle, and my feeling was his best work was done with Billy May. Billy May did the arrangements, just, his arrangements just knocked me out. And a good example of the album that he did with Sinatra was uh, Come Fly With Me, which I think it was the first stereo record that Capitol ever put out. That, to me, was the last good Sinatra album. Really? I, I, I'm more fascinated with him in the radio years with the Dorseys. Yeah. Because you just hear that energy in his voice. Yeah. Oh, oh, there, there, it's a Basie. You're talking about the Basie album. Yeah. I mean, the, the stuff he was doing then, and, you know, if you're an old-time radio person, the stuff he did for Armed Forces Radio was very entertaining. Yeah. It still holds up, it, it, you know? Yeah. Uh, and this is produced by Quincy Jones. So yeah. It's, but it, it's it, a great but, album. But the arrangements, the arrangements on that album are by Neil Hefty. Is that right? Uh, yes. <laughs> Neil Hefty. Yeah. No, no. Billy May did the. Uh, no, wait a minute. What did, Hefty. did Hefty do the uh, Batman thing? Yeah, yeah. Hefty was one of the original bebop or jazz yeah. artists, too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because Hefty also did the uh, Odd Couple theme. Mm -hmm. uh, and That's it, right. It, it, I watched it, The Odd Couple the other night and it, I noticed that. Yeah. And uh, he, uh, he did the arrangements for Basie in those days, finally. Uh, it was getting to be quite a thing. We're being joined by Patrick. Hello, Patrick. We're, oh, no. we're we're picking up on Sinatra again, uh, oh, no. but uh, um, uh, all I'm saying is that for me, Billy May it did the best arrangements for him. I did, they just knocked me out. They're just what? 
What are some of the ba what are the Billy May songs that you're talking about? Well, because come fly with me. The whole album come fly with me. Okay. It's Billy okay. Billy May arrangements. Uh, and then he, you have to go throughout his he 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 didn't work with Sinatra as much as he probably would have because Sinatra, the guy he wanted when he went to Capitol was Billy May, but Billy May was too busy doing stuff for Nat Cole. Now here's the thing I've never been able to figure out. Usually when people are on the same label. At some point, they do a duet, or they do a recording together. Why is it Sinatra and Nat Cole never recorded something together? Yep, there was a mutual appreciation between the two of them that was unbelievable. Well, they, they because, were, was there, because was Nat it, didn't last long enough, he, right? He died fairly young. Well, but I'm thinking it might have had to do a little bit with Envy, too, because Nat Cole made Capitol Records, okay? Uh, Nat Cole uh, was uh, actually uh, Capitol Records was started by a guy named Johnny Mercer, who I think most of you people are aware of, and if you're not, you should be because he was a real talent. And he um, uh, he did uh, um, uh, uh, he started Capitol Records, and he found this guy, and his name was uh, of course uh, uh, Nat Cole. And Nat Cole was uh, being used as the, uh, by the way, our t oh, or no, our TV isn't frozen. I thought it was frozen. Oh, it's not. Uh, uh, Nat Cole, he found Nat Cole. And you know what Nat Cole was doing before he went to Capitol? You know all those songs you used to hear in elevators? Well, he was working for those companies turning out elevator music. Wow. Uh, wow. And, and Mercer found him and put him on Capitol. Uh, which he created uh, with uh, a guy by the name of uh, Wallach, I think was his name, who, who had a uh, music store. And uh, Nat Cole became the sensation, made, literally made Capitol Records. Well, now here in about 1952 comes this down-and-out singer they managed to get pretty cheap by the name of Frank Sinatra, and he suddenly becomes a sensation. So now where you were once the king of the walk and the biggest guy on the block, you now got this other guy, Sinatra, and I just wonder if there wasn't some kind of animosity personally. I mean, there might have been a mutual respect musically, but an animosity in other ways between them because they, they, they just never recorded together, and Sinatra was never one not to record with other people, you know. Uh, hmm. That's too bad. I, I know I'm, I've been a big fan of Nat Cole for years and years, and uh, same as Sinatra, and... You know, it's it, it funny you mention that because I never, it never dawned on me until uh, you just said it on the same label. I mean, uh, duh. <laughs> and, uh, it, uh, you know, it's it just one of those obvious things that I guess I never, it never registered. And, and you're right, it would make a, a perfect, it would have made a perfect uh, duet sort of thing for one of the songs. Yeah. I, I, now I'm disappointed. Yeah, I'm disappointed, disappointed too. But I mean, he he recorded with a lot of other people. I mean, he would do stuff with a Keely Smith, for instance, who was on Capitol. She uh, has some voice. Oh God, she was great. Oh, that was maybe one of the greatest acts I ever saw. Uh, oh, guess who's joining us? Mr. Rebel Stoke himself, Jim Browning. Hello, Jim. Hi. Hello, Jim. Oh, Ooh, yeah. How with the tie you? again. Huh? Oh, oh my time. God! I want everybody on the TV to see this. <laughs> Look at him. The guy is wearing a tie. Look what at is that. What's wrong with you, Jim? <laughs> I'm sorry. I, no, I, no, I, I, I knew I was going to be talking about Frank, and I didn't want to be talking about Frank in a T-shirt. Not just a tie. That a not, that's a jacket. Yes, that's what they call <laughs> a jacket, Patrick. God Almighty! Look at me again. I'm I'm, I'm signing I, off. I'm done. I, I'm dressed for losing. <laughs> I, I'm dressed for losing again. I got my, uh, I got my what do you call it, son? My, uh, see that? Your sweats. Sweatpants? Your sweatpants. Yeah, but I'm not commando. I'm not commando. You've got to be kidding me, Jim. <laughs> well, let me turn on. <laughs> hey, if I was going to discuss Frank, I gotta, I gotta wear something appropriate. Yeah. That's cuckoo, Jim. Cuckoo. Cuckoo. Yeah. I, I just wanted to say I saw Frank Sinatra in Vancouver. In 1983, mm. really, and, and in '83 he was pretty damn good. Well, that was the year, or no, '81 is the year he reduced he he um, uh, re, uh, released New York, New York, which he still sounded great on. Yeah. So the, uh, the '81 is when he released that. Uh, well, oh you know, God. I I played something last night, and I sh I, I got to play it again. 
just because uh, uh, if I can find it fast. There we go. This was Sinatra in Milan. And the year, folks, was 1986. Now, April in Paris, let me, do I have a recording here? Where do I have a recording of him doing it where it's, uh, yeah, this is him with Billy May. Oh, no, that's Billy May just playing April in Paris. I'm looking for just the version he did uh, recording-wise. I can't, it isn't here. Anyway, it should be here. I just can't find it. But there's this thing at the beginning. The great thing about April in Paris when Sinatra did it was he started the song by doing the middle of the song, which I thought was brilliant because the middle of the song has this kind of phrase to it that's a great way to begin a song. So he started with the middle and then worked himself to the beginning. And the, the, oh, So the opening is this, uh, uh, the middle is that, I never knew, da, 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 never made a face to face, right? He takes it and just swoops into the song, except when he did it in Milan. I want you to listen to him in 1986. This is the Sinatra I never like to hear. Listen to this. charm of spring I never met it face to face Is that terrible? Is that horrible? Now yeah. listen to him when he did it with Billy May, right? And I can do this because, Jim, you can learn this. This is within the context of a fair usage because I'm making commentary on the music. Listen to the way it should go and the 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 the, the, the the ability he had when he did it with Billy May. I never knew the spring. Never met it face to face. See the difference? <laughs> between, the first one sounds almost hollow. Between that and... There's another one from thing. Milan. No, this one isn't it's the same. I never knew the See, he was okay there too. But then it, all of a sudden, he, it just was so bad when I heard that Milan version of April in Paris that I went, I never want to hear that Sinatra again. Until, of course, now where I'm having an excuse to play it. But um, Speaking of people who've lost it, has anybody, have you ever heard whitney houston trying to sing her song uh the one where she's most famous for you mean the dolly uh, parton song yeah yeah and she's where she was booed off the stage no she oh my god you gotta google it uh it's in it's on youtube you've got to hear it it's a train wreck really you, you can't believe it you just can't imagine it because it doesn't even sound like whitney houston this is when she was all trying to make a comeback near the very end and she cannot sing the song. You got to hear it. If you just, um, if you if you put in a search, uh, Whitney Houston gets booed off the stage. Yeah. You'll find it. Yeah. Well, wow. it, it's okay. kind. Of, what? What were you gonna say, Patrick? That that'd be an easy way to find it. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> you shouldn't have a it's, hard time. It's shocking. Finding. It's actually shocking. Uh, you know, uh, we were uh, last night. We got into this conversation on Sinatra because we were talking about people who have, you know. Some people need to have expiration dates written on their sides, you know. And when the expiration date happens, goodbye, thank you, you know, we loved hearing from you. And we, you live on in your recordings, or you live on in your TV shows, or your, your acting, or whatever. But I think it's true of sports people as well. Really? Like who? Oh, sports, <laughs> sports uh, athletes, for instance. Yeah, athletes who just don't want to, you know, to they're like, I'm a Yankee fan, so Jorge mm. Posada, his last year, instead of retiring, mm -hmm. he played on, and it got to the point where it was embarrassing because the Yankees, for all the years of the things he did, yeah. they you get, you get credit for that. So they put him in the lineup, and then at one point they dropped him to ninth in the batting oh, order. Oh, really? And he refused to play that night. 
So now you've got this kind of, you know, he, he sat himself and he he, reti- he, res- he finally resigned. But that last year was very difficult to watch well, because you love this well, guy. How about, and you remember how, all how about, he did. Yeah. And now he's a former shell well, of himself. Well, and how so, about looking at films of, uh, of Babe what? Ruth when he was fat and hanging out with hookers? Oh, wait a minute. That was the beginning of his career. <laughs> uh, uh, oh, uh, wait a minute. Uh, uh, we, 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 David wants to say something. David? Yeah. Please, please, my American friends, explain to me what is it about baseball you like? Because for me, it's like watching grass grow. I, I'm sorry, like. Uh, Josh? You're not, you, Josh, uh, David, you're not going to say the cricket is better, are you? No, no. Oh, okay. All know, right. But Back up a little bit so people can see your whole face because we're doing the TV thing tonight. Yeah, yeah there we okay. go. Because I, I still, I don't understand what's going on. I know what the home run is, okay. but I, I don't get it. I got a guy right in the screen next to you. His name is Josh. He will explain what is so great about baseball, and then I'll gang up on you after he's finished with you. Go ahead, Josh. <laughs> I just think it's, I just think it's, it's just cultural. I mean, I just grew up with it. So, I mean, so since you're on TV tonight, here, I'll, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll show you something here really quick since you're on TV. I'll turn this camera around. Yeah. I don't know if you can see my television very well. Yeah. Oh, oh you guys oh see that God. okay? Yeah, that's like the direct TV super everything that's on right. one screen. There's at the eight games. Huh? Yeah. I said that's right. There's eight games on one screen. So. Oh, my, my. <laughs> I don't know. It's just, well, now it's just ex- cultural, I well, guess. I'll tell you I something. Mean, well, let, let me see if I can try and explain it. I, I agree like, with you. It's a slow game. It, you know, yeah. they've sped it up over the years because when it finally hit television, they couldn't. It Baseball was a great radio game. You could describe baseball and almost make it more interesting than the game itself by describing it. OK, uh, the reason football became so popular was because that's a television game. There's a lot of action going on and running back and forth and. And uh, also, you can sh- take a shot of the whole field at the same time. So, uh, it, uh, each sport was me- uh, meant for a different uh, medium. When TV came in, over the years, baseball has had to uh, get faster. Am I right about that, Josh? They've sped up the game. But to a point, you yeah. can't. Baseball is not a kind of sport you're going to really speed up. It it has taken a hit because of it. A lot of the youth today with very short attention spans don't favor baseball. It's really fallen. In, yeah. in some areas, it's actually the third sport now. You was always number one, then behind football, number two, and in some areas now behind basketball as well. Yeah, yeah. it's just – but I think a lot – to answer his question, a lot of it too is that it's just it's just been around so long. It's it's In a lot of ways, it's like soccer for Europeans – or South Americans, mm-hmm. you know, that was their, that was like their original game. You know, that game has been around forever. I mean, baseball was invented in the 1860s. And I mean, it's been in American culture, you know, for forever. And then it's had times when it was the premier sport and it was in the spotlight because, you know, of world wars, etc. I mean, you know, people love the stories of the players who quit playing and went to war. I mean, it's just, it's just been a mainstream cultural, you know, entertainment for forever, really. Well, let me see if I can also explain it. And, you know, I'm not, uh, in spite of my sports, Emmy, I'm not as smart about sports as I seem. Uh, it, it, uh, it, baseball has a history. And it has a, a there are legends about baseball, you know. Um, it, it, it's, it's the only sport I think we have where there's really, truly a legendary history of, of baseball. And there is something about it that makes it what you consider to be boring. Have you ever been to a baseball game, David? Have you gone to one? Of, of course. And it's a, exactly. It, I went to the game with my American <laughs> friends. Yeah. And they didn't even care about the game. They were yeah. talking to each other, but that, that's eating what it, hot dogs, don't you, that, drinking that, beer. That's what's you wonderful know? about baseball. That's what's wonderful about baseball. You were sitting there. You were talking to each other. You were socializing. And then occasionally something would go on. Am I right, Josh? 
It's a game yeah. in which the, I mean you're waiting people, you're, yeah. you're waiting for that lightning to strike, you know? Yeah, for for a lot of people that's how it is. I mean, I'm more I'm just a bigger fan, so I mean, I don't go for any of that. I mean, I you know, I could go and not say a word to anybody and that that would be fine, you know? I mean, but you're right. I mean, people always say, you know, it gets really exciting like you get a home run or something like that, and that's this big exciting play. But, you know, in a lot of ways, though, football, if you go to the game, especially, football's yeah. like that on every play. The excitement that happens in a Major League Baseball park when, you know, there's a ball hitting the gap and the guy's running the bases and he's hitting second, he's going to try and stretch it to third, and here comes the throw, and, you know, all that, that tense waiting to see what's going to happen. Football's like that every play. I mean, unless the game's a blowout or something near the end. But, I mean, for the most part – when you know because i i go yeah. to a lot of football too because i'm a season ticket holder to Bengals. football's like that every play i mean people at football games are well, out you're of a mind. cincinnati sucker aren't you you got the Bengals yeah. going well, and the reds live, going so. patrick you you got your hand up yeah i i just want to kind of agree with david in this sense i don't like baseball anymore because of the damn stadium here in milwaukee that i'm still paying for <laughs> and they extended the fucking tax for another uh, 11 years. So the Brewers can kiss my ass. <laughs> I, mean, I went to that stadium. Pretty cool stadium. That's... Really? Yeah. Well, I, I, mean, I, I, understand. I mean, I understand the gripe about how they're publicly funded because they built the two stadiums here in Cincinnati, for example, and Hamilton County, you know, helped pay the money with a sales tax. And the lease that the Reds got was pretty good. But the Bengals completely fleeced Hamilton County. I mean, it's like the county actually has to buy a new scoreboard for the stadium every, like, 10 years. Uh, Great American Ballpark, the baseball stadium, and the football stadium both got new fields this year mm -hmm. that the county paid for, not the team, the county. That was part of the lease of the money. But what I will say is what separates the two stadiums is about maybe a half a mile. You can walk from one to the other. And it used to be a rundown, desolate area that you wouldn't walk in after dark at the old stadium. I mean, when I used to go to games at the old stadium, when you walked out, you literally, on your way from the stadium to the car, you were on high alert. I mean, you almost wanted to be armed. And now, that area, everything, they call it the banks because it's right on the bank of the Ohio River. Everything is brand spanking new. There's restaurants, there's bars. Yeah, but here's the there's question. There's 50,000 people I, down I, there, 50,000 people yeah. downtown every night that there's a Reds game. And I mean... Without that, that money would be gone. So I mean, it was exactly. like an investment. But I think exactly. Patrick had a ha, has has a very good point that he's bringing up here, and that is that the um, um, uh, why should a privately owned business, which these things are, and our for profit companies, many times be supported by the local station, uh, the, the local municipality that they're in. Shouldn't, that happens in everything. You know, though, Alex, oh, oh, right. oh, the Cincinnati Reds can't afford to keep playing baseball in Cincinnati anymore. They're going to have to move so, to Podunk, and then everybody but, says, oh, here, here's money from the city to keep you here. Patrick, New York City does it all the time. Yep. Mm -hmm. They allow companies to come in. They give them amazing tax breaks to, to you know, to bring, yeah. you know, to bring uh, – revenue into their town to bring people there to, to, to open up businesses and you know. Yeah. Well, the, the, I mean, right. Real, just real quick before yeah. Patrick, I guess what I would say is there are a lot of things that I pay taxes for mm -hmm. that I don't like, but that's just, everybody can't, you know what I'm saying? I pay for things that I think are ridiculously stupid. He pays like for a stadium that he thinks, right. He pays for a stadium that he thinks. Okay, is but maybe maybe you're paying. I for, mean, it's just but, it's but a trade Josh, you know, Maybe you're all. paying for a road or something. It, it, it Here you're paying you're Josh. paying for a bunch of people to make money, right. the, what, the <laughs> and bring money in. Yeah. yeah, but it's a huge job creator in Cincinnati. Huge. I'm telling you, if if the two teams left Cincinnati, I'm being serious. It would it would kill the city. It would absolutely kill really? that city. Cincinnati well, media there. You've yeah. got the teams right. come in. You've got hotels. You've got it's, restaurants. It's, it's a whole sub. It uh, would kill you know, economy. Not yeah, in Milwaukee. It would kill it. Well, I mean, yeah, all, I'm not sure. All Miller Park did was replace County Stadium. Yeah, and right. there have been a few businesses that have popped up, but that whole area was already saturated, so it created nothing. And most of the jobs that were from Miller uh, that are at Miller Park. 
came from county stadium workers. Yeah. And, you know, now we're looking at a new stadium for the Milwaukee Bucks who can't even win against the high school team. But here's my big bitch about it. And, Rob, you make a good point with every business gets tax breaks and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. We were given this tax starting in 2000, and it was supposed to end this year, 14 years. They extended it for another 11 years, I believe, Mm -hmm. because they just did. I mean, I think history shows once you put a tax in place, it's never going to go away. Right. And that's my big problem is I have, I don't have an issue with giving, like, a tax break. Like, you know, you you pay only so much. Your taxes are this much for 10 years, mm-hmm. you know, so you bring revenue in. Or you give them a um, some sort of incentive to build. But it shouldn't be on the back of the taxpayers. And that's no. for any business. And... Um. You know, I mean, like I said, I'm paying for a stadium now, 14 years, and I got another 11 years to do it. And how much you know do you think you've paid? Happen? How much what's do you that? think you've paid? How much do you think you've paid in that tax? How much do you oh, pay it, a year? It, it, now I know you're gonna laugh when I tell you, but it's not the amount. Wait, wait we'll laugh it's ahead of time. Like, How's that? It, it's <laughs> one tenth of one percent. Huh? It's what? One tenth of one percent. Okay, but you know, I mean, I it's, I I just think that these are businesses, you know, and I, and and uh, Josh, don't hate me for saying this, they are just games, after all. Oh, I agree. You I know? mean, don't I get think me wrong. that's I where you're wrong, though. I think that's where you're wrong, though. Not just games. There, if it were just games, I would agree with you, but it's about the Islanders leaving Nassau County because the taxpayers didn't want to make a payment, right? Now, that is going to have a, a, a trickle-down effect in Nassau mm-hmm. County. It's going to cost them even more. There's a lot of competition out there for teams. You know, Montreal, I was watching the Yankees right at the end of spring, spring training. Yeah. Montreal, who lost the team to Washington here, the Nationals, moved. Montreal is making a play again now to get another major league team. So yeah. if Milwaukee didn't get a new stadium... You know, they go and they woo them. We'll give you this. We'll give you this. If you're if if Milwaukee lost the Brewers, all that all those jobs, you're saying no new jobs are created, but you would lose a ton of jobs and a ton of money coming into that marketplace because you don't have a team there anymore. So you have to keep that in mind. Well, yeah, yeah it's but, a, but there was nothing wrong with county. St- For example, Lambeau Field up in Green Bay, it is older the hills, and what they did what they re, re, uh, remodeled it. County Stadium mm-hmm. was built in the 50s. It did need work. They could have remodeled it instead of knocking it down and building a new one. And, you know, the big deal that they wanted here in Milwaukee was the retractable roof. Who they fucking cares? Have. Okay, uh, let me just say something. David, see all, yes. the, tr- see all the trouble you've started here? Yeah, I'm very sorry. I I don't know. I I mean, I I think it's a local issue, but, I mean, it works in Cincinnati. If it doesn't work in Milwaukee, I don't live there. But I think the one thing you have to understand about baseball, though, they had to have that stadium with that retractable roof, et cetera, because they have to get people in there, and their attendance was sagging because no one liked the old stadium. Mm -hmm. And every club in ML in major league baseball except for a, maybe three or four has built new stadiums and the reason is is to drive revenue because the difference between it and lambeau field for example is you know the packers are like a, um they're just like a patriarch of the nfl and people would go no matter where they played yeah. but with baseball they don't have a salary cap either and the salaries and the payrolls are out of control and the number one d- revenue source yeah. for baseball teams is tickets um and then it's the tv money but it's ticket sales and if you can't get your season ticket base up and your ticket sales up to where you're averaging 25 30 thousand people a night you're not going to be able to push but, your but payroll up above 100 million dollars to one, compete there's one other factor here and and we haven't brought this up but it, it is a factor and that is that major league baseball shares its revenue with all the other teams. The reason right. being that you may have a loser team like, oh, let's just say the Reds. 
<laughs> well, they're a highly com- they're a, that's a bad example. But that's okay. Okay, but let's say the the Reds didn't have great attendance. Let's say the Reds were actually running at a deficit. They would the Major League Baseball would make up that deficit because they need the Reds. Because even though the Reds uh, don't uh, don't bring in a big uh, audience, and I I guess I could find a better team that would be a, an example of that. Like the Marlins? The Marlins, okay. Yeah. We'll, we'll use the Marlins as an example. You need the Marlins to make up the complement of people who play uh-huh. each other. So the fact that they just exist adds to the value of Major League Baseball. So why don't we have Major League Baseball pick up the tab for these uh, stadiums rather than, uh, than the people? Well, they do pay some sometimes for certain things. I mean, like in Oakland, for example, they're trying well, to step well, in. Well, hold on a second. We have somebody new tonight. Hello, Miranda. I heard about you from uh, Revelstoke Gym. Are you there? Miranda? Can you hear us, Miranda? Huh. She's there, but I, we can't. She can't, obviously, she can't hear us. We hope she I'm calls. here now. Oh, oh, there she is. There's Miranda. Okay. Hi, Miranda. Welcome to the group. Hello. Uh, yeah, we're we're talking baseball right now. Where where where, where do we baseball leave? Baseball and Frank Sinatra. <laughs> I had to call in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, we hit the oh, trifecta. She's a, she's a big Dodger fan. Oh, is she really? Oh, yeah. the Dodgers. <laughs> uh, okay. So where were we? What were we saying? Well, uh, I guess what I was saying was I guess what you should understand about pretty much every Major League Baseball team and Major League Baseball as an entity mm-hmm. is they don't bank their money. Okay, there yeah. is no bank account for MLB where they have billions of dollars in a bank account like Apple does that they're not spending. They yeah. all put their money back into their, their product. For example, the Cincinnati Reds don't make a profit. They put all the money back into the team. When they have extra money, what they do is they raise the payroll. They also do an, a crap load of charitable things in the Cincinnati area. Mm-hmm. They remodel a high school baseball stadium every year they've almost gone through the entire city i mean almost every high school team in cincinnati has a brand new state-of-the-art baseball stadium that the taxpayers didn't pay for locally that the reds paid for i mean mlb what they do with that extra money is what you're saying is they distribute it among the 30 teams and then among other things their Mm. charitable deals you know etc etc there's lots of things but so i guess i just want people to understand they're not these there are no owners in major league baseball that take yeah. money from their team and put it in their pocket and sit at home, you know, like some fat cat banker. Well, I mean, well, it has well, happened in the past. Yeah. There are a few examples of it. Um, the guy who owned the Dodgers recently was a guy who was basically, uh, you know, he was a real fucktard taking money from the team and all that. <laughs> but, you know, but he, but what happens okay, is... Okay, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Hold on a second. You just said something that hit Miranda. I can see... I, we finally have an infusion of estrogen here. Let's hear what she has to say. Oh, I, I do not even want to get started on the previous owner of the Los Angeles. Was that Dodgers. the guy? Was that the that guy, guy who got good. divorced or something? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that and the guy team was. Uh, but see what I'm saying <laughs> was is, a though, mess. that's a, that's a good example because Major League Baseball stepped in and basically forced him out. You mm-hmm. know, because they said this is not how we operate. MLB and the other 29 owners said, this isn't how we operate. We share revenue in this league. We have winners and losers, but we're working on it. Mm-hmm. You are going to ruin this game. You're you're ruining the Dodgers, basically. Yeah, and it, it was an embarrassing time to be a fan. It really was. Right. Well, yeah. but, it, 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 embarrassing. But nice em, wait a minute. Hold on a second. Embarrassing on okay. what level, Miranda? I mean, uh, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't the team's fault that this guy was, as you say, a fucktard. Yeah. <laughs> well, I wasn't the one who said oh, that. He, but, uh, I, I, I would definitely agree. Yeah. Um, but it, it's just, it was one of those things where this is not what is best for the team. It's not what's best for the sport as a whole. And most importantly, it's not what's best as, you know, for the fans. Just yeah. take your take your personal stuff and deal with that. It, it really just got down to a point where it was... I'm, I know I wasn't the only one. I, I was begging, just just please sell the team, knock this off. It's embarrassing. Yeah. Now, right. if I remember correctly, on. let me let me for people who aren't aware of what we're talking about, there were these people who uh, this couple and the guy owned the team. I think she she owned it too with him, didn't she? 
or something. Well, and, well and, they were they were married, so she de facto. Yeah, right. Gets half, and uh, then they went through this divorce, and it was very ugly, and it affected the team, and it affected right. the, the monies that were uh, the the team almost went broke as a result of the divorce case and so on. Yeah. So they finally got him out of there, and now Miranda's a happy camper. Frank McCourt and his wife. Yeah, Frank McCourt and Jamie McCourt. Yeah, his his wife is Jamie. Yeah, but, I mean, that's – I mean, uh, the sports leagues, in my mind, I think, you know, they're the perfect capitalist example of supply and demand because when people don't show up to the games, the ticket prices go down. When the stadium's sold out every night, the ticket prices go up. I mean – People got mad at, at the owner of the Cincinnati, or the Cincinnati Bengals a couple years ago, and they literally stopped going to the games, and my fucking season tickets went down every year the last three years. I mean, every year they send me a letter and say, your tickets are cheaper than last year. It's the perfect example can, of capitalism and supply and demand. Can a team do too well, though? Here's my point. Years ago, when uh, the uh, Dodgers moved to California and Branch Rickey convinced, I think it was Branch Rickey, convinced the owner of the New York team, the The Giants, uh, Giants, to move to the West Coast because he knew that if he didn't have another team on the West Coast, they would be the Lone Rangers out there, and that wouldn't work. Cost Uh, them a fortune to travel. Right. No, it wasn't Branch Rickey. It was after Rickey. Was it after Rickey? Was it? Yeah. Uh, Okay. But in any event, uh, it was was a, 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 a... amazing move because he got the giants to go to san francisco and i think the dodgers even paid them to go there okay uh and i as a kid by the way see one of the reasons i've never been wasn't a big baseball fan is i was brought up on the west coast before there were any baseball teams out there except for what we call the pacific coast league which we could have been called the pacific pussy league because you know (laughs) they were just trying to be a team uh, admittedly, Joe DiMaggio did start with the San Francisco uh, Seals, I think it was. Uh, but these were all like farm teams for the uh, for the majors. And and so we never really got behind it. You know, if you were a kid growing up in Brooklyn, I write about this, uh, uh, Mark, um, you identified yourself with the team that you grew up with, right? You know? Like I said, the Dodgers Absolutely. were right. Huh? Dodgers, the Dodgers. I was three years af- after the Dodgers left. Yeah. So, to me, it was just an echo. Yeah. You know? it, was, uh, it, it was an echo. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, 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 and, and in fact, I had a friend, Steve Gruberg, who was a kid, was a big, was the head of the Dodgers, like kids, fan club <laughs> team thingy. And he hated the Dodgers when they moved to California. He felt betrayed. I mean, sure. but we never had that in California. We just grew up, you know, uh, who's your favorite cowboy? You know, I mean, and so it, it wasn't until the Giants came out along with the Dodgers that all of a sudden there was major league baseball coming out of the West Coast. And that also started filling up the rest of the country when they created the expansion teams so that you got Phoenix teams and you got whatever. Uh, but but you know, if, if you look at the map, they, uh, I think it's MLB or they're, they're, I found a map online of the United States and you look at where the teams are located. Yeah. It's really few and far between once you get west. It's really concentrated on the east and the Midwest. Well, that's where the original teams were, but you didn't have right. teams in Toronto. You didn't no. have teams in Phoenix. Uh, where else am I thinking of? Uh, uh, there are some te- aren't there some teams in Utah or something uh, no, that's it's basketball. Colorado. Colorado. Uh, Mark, Texas. you wanted to say something? You raised you were raising your hand, Mark. Yeah. It, it, it's funny because growing up, my parents couldn't care less about baseball, and it wasn't until a few years back. Remember, HBO Sports did a really, really good documentary on the Brooklyn Dodgers. Yeah. And this was this was right before my dad passed away, and the three of us—my mom, myself. My dad are watching this. And whenever they would show footage of, let's say, Duke Snyder, mm-hmm. my mom and dad became human computers. They knew every stat. And I was floored. I was like, wait a minute. You didn't, you never, you know, this was news to me. It's like the impact of them living, of them leaving Brooklyn. A lot of people just, not only did they not care about the LA Dodgers, they just yeah. said, the baseball in general. Yeah. Unbelievable. Well, let me ask you, Miranda. Um, um, 
how did you get to like the Dodgers? How did you pick the Dodgers? I mean, you are you live where? You're in... I am in Anaheim, California. Oh, you are in Anaheim. Oh, I okay. Am. Well, in then... Fact, I, I, I don't mind disclosing this. I actually live... Uh, I, I can see Angel Stadium uh, from within okay. my was, apartment complex. Okay, so why the, why the Dodgers instead of the Angels? Because uh, the Angels suck. The Dodgers <laughs> uh, moved out to California, actually, long before I was born. <laughs> my uh, my dad grew up in Los Angeles, uh -huh. and he was a big baseball fan. Yeah, uh, quite the opposite of what you were just saying, actually. And uh, his favorite team was the Brooklyn Dodgers, and so it made his day when they came out to Los Angeles. And uh, yeah, but what would have happened to your life had his favorite team been the New York Yankees? <laughs> I probably wouldn't have been born. Really? <laughs> and are that you was a... true though. That, that's how you. That's what you know. Was trying to tell David earlier is. I mean, that's how it is. I mean, uh, that's how I became a Reds fan. Not only because we're from the area, but I mean, I can't imagine being like ten and years old and being like, oh no, I'm not going to be a Reds fan. I like, uh, I like the Oakland A's or something. I mean, my grandfather, for example, would have been like. He probably would just stop talking to me like you're you're fucking stupid. That's that's not happening. So I mean, personally, so what we don't have any kids, and yeah. we're not gonna have any. But if I had a kid, I can't imagine him not. I mean, like seriously, you're gonna be a Cardinals fan? <laughs> I mean, do it on your own time, bro, because you're not doing it. My here, father, you know? my father wasn't a sports fan. The only thing he ever watched was boxing, uh, and he loved that's, boxing. And I often, you know, I've often told I often told the story about how I said to him, Dad, you know, you're the most nonviolent man I know. And yet you love watching boxing. What What is it about boxing you love? And he says, I love to watch two guys beating their brains out in the middle of a ring and being glad I'm not one of them. <laughs> that was his entire explanation of why he liked boxing. And he would sit so, there in front of the screen yelling and screaming, hit that son of a bitch, you know. And I'm going, my father is not a violent man. You know, and I could never figure it out. It's what uh, sports, uh, it's what it does to people, you know. But I never became, you know, you're, you're different when you're. Would you say, though, that you game? are you are inculcated with sports in much the same way that your parents' politics, uh, uh, maybe, perhaps, influenced your I, politics? I think that has a lot to do with it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. It's, it's pretty much the same. Right. That's just like my uh, uh, leftist uh, view. I can't, I grew up in a household like that. I can't imagine saying. You know, to my mom and dad when I was 15 or something, like, oh, no, you're wrong. And, you know, they, I mean, they would have accepted it. But what I'm saying is, is it's just, they, you know, they wouldn't have understood it. You know, I mean, it's not like they would have disowned me or anything, but if I would have been like some Republican based, you know, like Patrick or something like that, I mean, they just would have rolled their eyes. Now, Patrick, you know, so. we're, we're, now, you know, you're the Republican in the group. Boo, hiss, hiss, boo. Okay. Mm. You know what? Well, you know you know why you're paralyzed? It's because you're a Republican. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh my He's the Alex yeah, P. Yeah, Keaton you know. of the group. <laughs> Ooh. Like what what Josh just said? I grew up in a. I mean, my entire family, extended family and all, are are all Democrats, or at least when I was a kid. I've got two cousins that are are right wingers, but. When I was growing up, the politics was all Democrat. It, it was all union. It was all Democrat. It was all, mm -hmm. all of that. And I was the black sheep. And to this day, my mother, she just sits and, and you know, still bring up every once in a while, where, where did you come from? You are the you know? Alex P. Keaton of the crowd here. <laughs> <laughs> the stork dropped you off. Yeah. Now, I want to know yeah. why that, why yeah. that, you see, like, for instance, uh, Miranda, where do you lie politically? I would, uh, I, I'm saying to the left. Pretty far to the left. Oh, pretty far to the left. Where were your parents? Uh, pretty far to the left. See? Now, what was it that, uh, and Jim, where do you stand politically? We, we figure, and you know Jim, Miranda because she's called your show and you've gotten to know her. But yeah. where, 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 where are your, your politics are to the left? That I know. Yeah. Okay, yeah. were your parents that way too? Yeah. So they influenced your politics. They did until I started. I got till I got to the point when I thought, okay, I have to make my own decision, and 
you know, I, I, oh my I, God, I, I become my, pa- that, that's where I'm going. My God, I become my parents. <laughs> yeah. That's uh, so why, I mean, why, why Patrick, why were you, what was it between you and the relationship with your family that made you not adopt their politics? Um, you know, the experiences that I was, that I was dealing with, um, I would say it, I, I never was against my family growing up yeah. because I was too young to really formulate any good argument to say, I think that's wrong or that's right. Um, when I hit high school, um, just listening to, to some of the uh, political things that were going on historically, I mm-hmm. seemed to gravitate more toward being a hawk. Okay. Which, at that point, uh, we were starting the first Gulf War, and that was George Bush Sr. And I realized that a lot of my own beliefs were gravitating toward that, but I... I couldn't tell you I was a Republican at that point. It wasn't until after I got paralyzed that I really dug my heels in as being conservative Mm -hmm. because of all the bullshit I had to put up with to try to get any assistance and that sort of thing. And it just, I realized that the system is not set up to help people like has been parroted would by you like it but these... would, would you like it to uh, what's that would you like it to i think it needs to well let me just give you a quick example okay um after i after i came home from the hospital and i'm sure i've told this story before but I, other people haven't heard it In case miranda um, is not aware uh, he decided to become a paraplegic it, yes, but that. actually my anniversary is on Monday, and I'm going out to dinner like I do every year. So, yeah, uh, it'll be 11 years on Monday. Wow. But anyway, um, when I decided to become paralyzed and I came home, yeah, um, I needed basically 24-hour nurse care, and because I was still wearing a turtle shell sort of thing yeah. to keep me from moving and and that sort of thing. And I wasn't literally able to wipe my ass or anything like that. And the only way that I was able to get any sort of assistance yeah. without me paying for it out of pocket yeah. was uh, quit my job. And my understanding of the system was you're supposed to, like any, any help sort of thing, was they're there to help you get back to work. Mm-hmm. And it made zero sense to me that all of the money that I had been paying into, like in the Social Security and that sort of thing, that I was not able to get some sort of disability assistance right. without quitting my job because the whole purpose, as, at least in Wisconsin and Milwaukee, and you know, we're going to help you so you can get back to work. Right. It was all bullshit. And I realized that okay. the system was rigged to keep people under the see, system. I would, I, I, see, I, 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 see, I would have thought, yeah. wait a minute, I, I would have thought uh, that that kind of experience would have actually made you a left winger rather than a right winger. Exactly. Uh, uh, Jim, you seem no, to I, be I, nodding. I, I understand what well, you're saying, why it didn't. Well, I just, I, I, I understand where Patrick's coming from. And I, but my, my thought is, well, you know, but it, it's been both sides it, it it just hasn't been one side that it ha- has has messed with all the infrastructure that probably caused you not to be able to get you know the the help you needed and the uh, you know and you had to quit your job. I from what I understand, you know it's 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 sort of each each party messes with you know your governmental infrastructure over the yeah. years. So basically, wouldn't both parties be to blame? Well, in the right, line. Jim, but you got to understand, it was at that point I started doing my own research uh, as okay. to where my belief fell, because I, I will tell you this much, what really pissed me off is the welfare state, I believe, mm-hmm. had never been put together the way that it was meant to be, which was a helping hand. And I understood at that point why some people never get off of welfare 
and it becomes a generational thing because mm. there's never any incentive to get to work. Well, look, uh, uh, yeah, but I, you go I, I, to work, I, yeah. you're going to make no, less. Well, that, but, but that's the problem. They've never been able to figure out a way to wean people off of it. In other right. words, the penalty was too large for getting off of it. Uh, yeah. They should have been able to leave people on relief for a while until they raised to a certain enough level that they wouldn't feel the loss of income. You get what I'm saying? And it's, it's, oh, that's why it's always been a trap. And the reason it's a trap is because it was a system created by people who weren't sympathetic at all. And, and let me just well, and, I, this, uh, and I noticed, wait a minute, I want to get Miranda into this because I noticed you were nodding with approval as to what I was saying. Oh, it, <laughs> it, it's, I, I think you were spot on. It, I, 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 I think if, if we actually made the additional investment to, to, to help bridge the gap and, and, and get them back into uh, the, the ability to, to earn a decent living and everything and, and get back to work. And, and I, I just think if, if we made the little extra effort to help bridge that gap, then the overall, the overall cost of the program would actually trend down because we wouldn't have these people who are, you know, generationally just, you because know, moving we, forward, what, what not we, having what, any incentive to get off of what, it. What we don't say with welfare is, well, look, we'll let you stay on welfare until you're making as much as you're getting from welfare. Okay. Right, right. Instead, what we say is, if you suddenly start working and you get X number of dollars, no more welfare, even though it may cut your salary in half. You know, so what's the incentive? The incentive is to yeah. stay on welfare. And do what yep. I do every day: watch the soap operas. Uh, and and if there was some kind of way to to uh, to raise them up to the to the level that they are getting it, it, while they're on welfare, it's a weaning. It's a weaning. The overall off. price yeah. uh, or the overall cost right. of the program will go down. Yeah. Less abuse. You're, it's you, it's. I, li I, don't know, I like you, Miranda. Clear. You're very bright. You're very bright, and you agree with me. So that's why I like you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Patrick. We all like people who I, agree with us. Of course. <laughs> Patrick. I, I just wanted to, to just finish this off on, on my end anyway. And, and the reason it didn't turn me into a lefty, as you said, was my work ethic was mm -hmm. such that I was not going to quit my job under any circumstances. Mm -hmm. And I was, I, you know, and you guys I, can laugh. But, you know, the, the term, I think it was Reagan that said, pull yourself up by the bootstraps. Well, you know what happens when well, you do that? You fall flat on your ass. <laughs> well, essentially, that's what happened is I was, and, and I'll tell you, I was very fortunate that my mother was able mm -hmm. to step in, and she moved in with me for three of the most miserable months of my life. Yeah. Uh, for her as well. Because together, we had to learn how to relive together. And my stepdad would come right. visit on the weekend for conjugal visits or whatever. You know, I told him, <laughs> just keep it down in the other room. Um, you know, but, uh, you know, it, that really what, what motivated me was realizing that mm. the system's not set right. up to help people. And I was not about to fall into that trap. Right. And, you know, okay. that, and then I, like I said, went to Jim earlier, uh, then I just started researching things, and, and I found that I, I seem to agree more with conservative okay. thought than I do with liberal. Let me break in here uh, to play this little game, which we have to play every now and then. What is David eating? Now, every now and then, David <laughs> leaves the screen. <laughs> the other night, the other night, it was sausage. Right? And tonight? No, I, when I was calling Albert's program, I was eating... Uh, 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 move back, move back a little bit so we can see you. Uh, your forehead is, is uh, just move back just so we can see your face. Oh, yeah. Sorry. And yes. I'm, I'm, I'm finishing with dessert waffles with ice cream. Uh, oh, what with ice cream? Waffles. Yeah. Waffles with ice cream. Okay. Uh, uh, that's a new game we're going to play from here on in. What is David <laughs> eating? But he had get a little jingle earlier. for it. Uh, yes. Uh, the, uh, Miranda, were you raising your hand? 
there? I, no. Oh, 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 okay. Whenever I see a hand raise, I think maybe somebody wants to talk. Um, Josh, so how did the Reds do tonight? They lost four to oh, three. Shit. Four to three, and who yeah. were they playing? They're in New York in the rain. They played the Mets. Yeah, and 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 how many games uh, are we into the season? Uh, four. And you're depressed. No, I didn't say I was depressed. I, when you came on, I said, how are you? And I said, I feel like crap. I said, I'm a little upset. I'm a little upset. I don't like losing. No, I mean, I'm over it now. What happens is, is when the game's over, I have about 15 minutes mm -hmm. where I, I fume. Yeah. And I'm very unpleasant. Yeah. And then after the 15 minutes, yeah. basically, that's gone and over with, and then I move on to the next day. Uh, uh, Miranda, are you that way with the uh, with the Dodgers? Uh, Well... For the most part, yeah. I, I'm actually also a really big Angels fan as well. Oh, and I see. It's not a problem because they're in different leagues. It's only an issue when they play each other. And, yeah. You know. Now, let, well. me, let me ask you something, Miranda. I noticed there, number one, you have a very nice microphone. And you, have, you. A, you have a windscreen. Mm -hmm. uh, so you must be doing some kind of broadcasting in one way or another. Yes. Um uh, a friend and I, uh, that fracking cat, he uh, interacts with Jim quite a bit as yeah. well. Yeah. Uh, both of us do a podcast. Uh, uh, do, uh, regarding what? Uh, we're we're both fans of movies, so uh, every Saturday night we, you know, we've been doing it for about a year and a half and consistently, and then, uh, you know, off and on before that, but. Uh, it, uh, Pretty much every Saturday night, we uh, call each other up on Skype and watch the uh, same movie, get it synchronized, and and. Oh, is that the thing you do, you do, uh, Jim, where where you watch a, a movie with other people? Yeah, but I do that on uh, Turner Classic Movies. Oh, I like see. We all watch we all watch a movie on Turner Classic Movies, and then we we Twitter and tweet back and forth with the hashtag of the movie and Turner Classic Movies. So, yeah, it's like watching a movie with a with a group of people. But uh, Miranda and uh, uh, that fracking cat, uh, I've, I've listened to a couple of their podcasts, and, it, and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's quite amusing and, uh, and uh, quite it, enjoyable. But, it's well, basically the, co the conversation leading up to us watching the movie, and mm. then inevitably one of us does something stupid, and we'll cut it in at the end. Oh, you know, oh. just a couple of friends having a good time together. And That's then it. Do, you do, this yeah, some, do, you, do you do this live, or do you record it and then put it up as a uh, podcast? No, we, we, do a, uh, we, we record it and then post it the, hopefully the next day. It depends on... Uh, Wow. Yeah, it depends on the weekend. Yeah, you know, it'd be a nice thing for her to do for us once a week or something if you if you wanted to and do it live and let other people like these interact with you as well. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, we should talk about it. We really should. Uh, yeah, I mean, okay. I you know, we're, right. we're looking All for right. programming here cuz if you call Jim and I programming, you don't uh, you got no sense what radio should be. Uh, and <laughs> We get you. We get you a sports. We get you a sports show too. You have sports, movies, politics. I would love somebody. Like, uh, here's what I would like. Number one, I, I, Miranda. I don't know how old you are, but you look a lot younger than the rest of this group. Uh, and and I want some. In my I, early 30s. I like somebody young. Somebody who's uh, 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 um, uh, is you know into sports. For instance, we could use somebody with sports and movies, and you know you you fit that bill better than. Uh, you know, a lot of other things I can think of. We're trying to figure out how to do something with Josh here. Uh, we just haven't figured out how to do it yet and how to best implement it. But uh, yeah, you could come and join the rest of us on GabNet as as we're known in the movie trade, the Expendables. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it pays great. <laughs> Um, you, you said that one of the things you wanted to call up about was the Sinatra discussion that we were having. Well, I've, I've just always liked Frank Sinatra, and so uh, when you started talking about it, it just made me think of some of my uh, my memories. And... Well, but, yeah, but this is interesting. You say you're in your early 30s, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Frank Sinatra. He was almost dead by the time you would know he existed. Yes and no. I was, well, I was a big band geek. Um, I've, I've, I've always been kind of musically inclined, uh, 
so m my parents listened to a wide variety of music and and that obviously shaped my taste in music so mm -hmm. i grew up listening to uh a lot of stuff that that a lot of my friends didn't be just by the simple fact that my my parents were a few years older um you know m my dad's really into uh like older jazz um right uh big band you know uh not not so much you know like rock and roll and like you know like class what we would call classic rock now like most of my friends parents were you yeah. know my, my my dad's uh musical taste skewed a little bit older and so i just got exposed to to so much and you know how how do you not fall in love with frank sinatra's voice uh, <laughs> an amazing amazing instrument is mm -hmm. the best way to describe it. But, you know, the thing is, what I find interesting in you, and I think it's important, when I was growing up, everybody used to say, how old are you? Because I used to be talking about stuff that went on, movies that were on, it happened in the 30s, and silent films and things like that. And, they go, you, you, it, you? and I always had a fascination with those things that happened before I was born. I really didn't care what was happening right now. Oh yeah, I listened in those days to like Elvis Presley, and I thought Fats Domino was terrific, and I realized that I liked him because he was the music I would eventually come to love, which is New Orleans music, and he was probably the worst progenitor of it than any of them, uh, but that was when I got taste, and and I um, so I always had this old soul that way. So when I meet somebody up with somebody like you, who's an old soul. Who I don't, you know, can, I I can talk about Sinatra's music, and I don't have to explain it to you. I find that really amazing, and I find it very bright and smart. You know. So. Well, I can <laughs> I can I can actually oh, wait a minute. Can... Wait, wait a minute. Is David returning with more food? No, no, no. <laughs> oh, oh, my teeth. My yeah. after meal. Uh, okay, oh. fine. Anyway. Uh, but uh, what were you going to say, Jim? Are you going to say something about that? Oh, no, I was just going to—I was going to say that. Uh, I mean, that was the same thing when uh, you and I met. Uh, mm -hmm. The fact that we clicked on so many things that uh, that were essentially, uh, you know, before my time, and, and and just our tastes were were kind of like that, and and uh, uh, so that helped us mesh when we met because we could talk about those things. Yeah. That uh, that were of a different age I, I, you know i can uh, i can actually on. i can connect uh, your frank sinatra discussion with our baseball discussion tonight uh with a, a a small story is actually i don't know how many people actually watch baseball pretty seriously but the starting third baseman for the cincinnati reds is, is todd frazier and all ball players have walk-up music uh you know when they walk up to the plate to hit and when you think about baseball players, you know, a lot of them, they have rap music or some kind of, you know, really uh, current pop music or whatever. And uh, they get to pick they get career, to, they his get, entire career. Yeah. F Frazier, uh, Todd Frazier's walk up music is Frank Sinatra. <laughs> and he's he's 25 years old. And is it uh, any particular you know? song or is it just a whole? He uh, he has a series of three. His first at bat, I think, is usually Fly Me to the Moon. The second at bat is another one. And then the third at bat is another one. And then they start over if he has, you know, after the three at bats. Yeah, he he loves Sinatra, and uh, they say he does uh, an incredible impersonation. They have a, uh, he sings for him in the clubhouse. They got a big stereo and everything in there for him. He, <laughs> he's a like in a he he loves Sinatra. All this comes full Ball circle. Player. Wait a minute, did I see Rob uh, lifting his finger? No, I'm just uh, uh, oh because you see you're in the dark tonight, so I can't tell when you raise your hand and when you don't. But I see that Jim is raising his hand. So yeah. no, I just want to. I uh, besides seeing uh, Frank in Vancouver in 1983, I just wanted to mention that uh, when when my family was living in Los Angeles, we uh, we took a road trip and this is like 1972 or something, and we went to Las Vegas mm -hmm. and. Um, uh, the the MGM Grand had opened up, and uh, you know my parents were upstairs doing the uh, the gaming stuff, and uh, down in the, uh, the like the sub basement of the the casino there was like an area for kids. There was an arcade and all sorts of stuff like that, and and there was these big long uh, service corridors, and uh, I was down in one 
uh, just walking through this area. And I could see, I think I've told the story on my show, uh, I could see this group of like five men walking the other direction, all in like blazers and ties. And I'm just walking towards them and, and they're walking t- uh, towards me. And we finally get close enough to sort of see each other. And it's like four guys and Frank Sinatra in the middle. And I know who he is because of my father's love of the music and the albums and everything. And I'm just kind of like stunned. And I mean, I couldn't help myself. And it was like in my little squeaky, like, oh, Mr. Sinatra. And and it basically not slowing down, still the walking pace. And it was like, hiya, kid, behaving yourself? I, yes, sir. Keep it up. And just kept walking right past me. Wow. And it was like, okay. You want to know what happened and, to me? You want, you want to hear one of my stories? Okay. It's kind of like that. My yeah. father was working at the Warfield Theater in San Francisco. My father was a violinist. He played with the orchestra. And the, or, the, the performer, what they used to do is they used to show a movie. And then they would show uh, maybe a, a companion feature. And then they would do a stage show. And they do six stage shows a day, starting at about 10 in the morning, and the last one starting about 10 at night, with uh, maybe a two-hour layover between the stage shows. And the stage show that week was Lena Horne. And my, and my father always used to say to me, I love Lena Horne. Uh, and, and what he was saying was, she was hot, all right? So I went, oh, hey, we're, we're joined by Sabrina and Jason McKinney. Hello, Sabrina and Jason. There they are. There's a pic- picture of them. We're about to ready to see the video on them. I'm just telling my story about Lena Horn. So my father, I'm, I'm a little kid, and I don't know why I did it myself, but my parents always trusted me to be able to take care of myself. And I guess I was like about eight years old, nine years old, and he, my father told me, meet me at the stage door. Or maybe even my mother brought me to the stage door. Meet me at the stage door so when the show's over, we can go out and have lunch, right? So as I'm standing there, who walks out but my father, followed by Lena Horn. And I immediately look at Lena Horn, this eight-year-old kid, and say, Miss Horn? And she goes, yes. You know, like, here's a sweet little kid. My daddy says he loves you. This is my daddy. <laughs> oh, that's so cute. And that's how I remember Lena Horn. So. It was similar to your story. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. My father never forgave me. He says, well, you couldn't come get me. And I said, the man was walking. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Well, I'm not going to yell, hey, Dad, Frank Sinatra. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Isn't that amazing? It's amazing. As kids, we get away with that stuff. If some adult had done that to Sinatra, he would have told him to fuck off. Or, the, or he'd, you know, <laughs> you'd cut back to a shot, and there'd still be five guys walking, and the guy would be a crumpled heap on the carpet. Okay, so this is this is this is fodder for something here. Let's go around the panel and ask this question: Who's the most famous person you ever met? I can't answer that question because I've 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 had uh, access to a lot of them. Uh, uh, Josh, Anita who's... Baker, huh? Anita Baker. Who who said that? Jason. Oh, Jason. Hi, hi, Jason. I didn't uh, I didn't see you there, Jason. And there's Sabrina. Hi, Sabrina. Uh, 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 who did you say? Anita Baker. Anita Baker. Okay, the singer. Okay. Yeah. Uh, how about you, uh, 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 Josh? Most famous person you ever met? You know, I have to try and think. I mean, I know I've run into a couple. Yeah. Probably the most interesting one. I mean, was meeting is not being in, in proximity. It's being able to say hello and they say hello back at the yeah, very well, least. The, the the most interesting one probably was. The last presidential election in 2012, the in here in Columbus, the Republican Party headquarters and the Democratic Party headquarters are right across the street from each other. Yeah. And I went to the Democratic headquarters and picked up some Obama signs, and I came out, and I was carrying them in front of me, and I was putting them in my van, and I turned around, and I bumped into a guy that was getting out of a car yeah. um, to go to the Republican headquarters, and it was Fred Thompson, the actor from Law and Order right. who, had, who, who was running for president. Yeah, and who's now and I bump so, into and him, and I'm s- holding this fucking Obama sign, <laughs> and he looks <laughs> right at me, and he says, 
uh, I worked for a company called OKI, and he read it as Oki. And I, he saw my uniform, and I bumped into him, and he says, Oki for Obama, huh? And I said, that's right. And I knew who he was, and I just kept up right on walking. Yeah. Now he's, now he's selling, uh, what, what's that, uh, those, uh, those loans you Reverse take? mortgages. Reverse mortgages. <laughs> Scams. Which, well, no, you, you can get all this money, and you never have to pay it back. But when you die and somebody inherits your home, if they can't pay it off, pay off that loan, <laughs> they get your house. Uh, yeah. Yo, what a crock of crap that is uh i'm afraid to ask david the most famous person he's met because i just saw him eating a cat just a few minutes ago i, I am alex i am a winner here huh? because i shook my hand with tom cruise when he was filming mission impossible in prague in 1996. well but that's that's a winner that's a winner yeah. okay uh let me see here uh uh a gym well See again, I, I mean, I, I was the Sinatra thing is, great, but then again, see when I was when I so was at with play in in at NAB in in uh, uh, New Orleans. It's kind of unfair because I, you know, um, uh, I, who did I get to meet? I got to meet uh, uh, and talk to Martha Stewart, and and not as famous uh, as Frank Sinatra. Frank Sinatra probably trumps everybody. Yeah, I think so, but I have to say that uh, uh, we went and had uh, we went and got a little drunk with Jerry Springer in New Orleans, and that was kind of well, fun. Well, I've had Jerry, uh, I've, I've, I've had Jerry Springer sitting on my bed. Oh, so <laughs> I saw pictures. I, of I that. hate to trump you on that, but oh, I, God. I had him sitting. I did a radio show, and I did it from my bedroom in bed all morning long. And one of my guests was uh, was Springer. And we actually wanted him to get in the bed, but he just wanted to sit on the edge of it. So, oh, well, yeah. he drank a lot that night too, and then he sang with every band we went and saw. Yeah. So, okay, but I'll, I'll still stick with Frank. Mark Thorner, most famous person you've ever met. Well, there's two. One I'm not going to tell you because that'll be a direct tip off of who I used to work for. So, Jimmy Durante. Oh, oh. how wonderful is that? He was by the way, by the way, by the way I, I, I want to see what an old soul uh, Miranda is. Miranda, Jimmy Durante. Do you know who that is? Uh, yes and no. What do you mean yes and no? You either know who he is or you Not don't know who he is. What? There we go. I <laughs> uh, see. I knew it was in there. It just took me a while to access it. And he worked with Sinatra quite often. And might I add, might I add, my father, uh, my father always, oh, there, he's going to eat the cat again. There's, there's, uh, there's uh, David with his cat. Yeah. Just start calling him Elf rather than David. <laughs> <laughs> uh, another story about my father and Jimmy Durante. My father was working with Durante. That's, you know, because again, a musician, and he worked the show with Durante. My father had a big nose on him. Uh, I can't even begin to do justice. I mean, it was a, it was a big nose. And uh, Durante walks by my father and looks at him and goes, I'm jealous. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, uh, that's the Jimmy Durante story. Uh, let me see here. So uh, where, where were we? Oh, Mark, so you say Jimmy Durante. Durante, yeah. That's a good one. That's a real good one. Okay, Miranda. Oh, I've got a lot of stories because of a place that I used to work at. Yeah. Um, but probably, well, I have a favorite one to tell. Okay. Um, and and, and the person is is Tom Hanks. Really, that's a good oh, one. Yes. Yes. Well, I, I, I can name off so many, you know, like uh, Andy Garcia, Anthony Hopkins, uh, Tommy Smothers, Helen Hunt, Kevin Now, Spacey. you must have been working um, somewhere where you bumped into these people. Yes. Talent yes. agency? Uh, it, was, it, was a it was a particular restaurant. Um, the Cheesecake Factory. Sorry? The, the Cheesecake Factory? I am not <laughs> an aspiring actress, no. <laughs> No, I worked at Club 33 in Disneyland. Oh, oh okay. All right. Ooh. So, ooh. Club yeah. 33 is, um, is what? Now everybody went, ooh, what is Club 33 exactly? <laughs> it's a very fancy private club inside Disneyland. Oh, I see. Oh. It, it was basically set up to be Walt Disney's uh, 
entertainment, um, like wh where he was going to take him wine and dine guests. Yeah. Uh, and it's a private membership club. And uh, I, that was my uh, second job. I worked there for five years. And wow. I have a ton of stories that. <laughs> can I ask you something? I don't know if you can reveal this. Who was the worst tipper? Uh, I, I didn't actually directly. Oh, you didn't. What, you, you didn't. Any of that. Oh, well, then what did you? Uh, what, what did you do there? I I was uh, primarily a lead. Um, there there was a uh, a, a period where I was injured, and so I worked the front door, which is uh, actually where my Helen Hunt story comes from. Uh huh. Uh, but uh, she, she's awesome. By really the way. nicest lady in the world. I had no idea who I was talking to. It was great. I, I found out later, you know, someone was like, oh, my God, Helen Hunt's here. And she's, you know, so great. Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, no, she's not. I would have had to let her in. And all of a sudden it clicked. It's like the blonde lady in the black baseball cap. Oh, my gosh. I was talking to Helen Hunt that entire time. Had no idea. That's so cool. She was yeah. so nice. So, but, you, but, um, but your list is probably not a long one then in that particular It's a very case. long one. But, but Tom Hanks is my favorite just because uh, I, I don't know if he still does this, but every year he would bring his son in. Uh, on his birthday, his son Chester, and they would, uh, they would, uh, you know, just have a nice dinner. And each year, um, yeah, th there's just so many stories that come out of it. But after I quit, I ended up finding out that apparently the next year when he had come in uh, for the birthday party, he had asked for me by name. Oh, how nice! Isn't that a and nice feeling? I had quit. <laughs> Yeah, why why did you quit? Why did you quit? Just got tired of the I, job? That or? story is one I do not share. Oh, okay. But uh uh it sounds like you you had an interesting time there. Uh Oh yeah. Yeah, it was a great job. It's, 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 you didn't quit because you wanted to grow a mustache, did you? Uh I, that that was actually part of it. Yes. Okay, yes. cuz I know they they were against facial hair in in the park. And then they yeah. then they changed it, you know? Uh, well, well, you know you know you know why they changed it cuz the French when they opened up Disney, Disney, what were the Disney Euro, Euro Actually, Disney? Actually, no, that's not the case. At Disneyland itself, it wasn't until Disney's California Adventure that they really started to uh, loosen up on the facial hair policy. And and I don't remember if if they had completely gotten rid of it by the time that I left, but uh, it was it was well on its way out. Right, because I because what I'm, I'm remember it was at, Disney's California Adventure, but at, you, at Disneyland itself at Euro Disney when they first opened up, they got a bad reputation. One of the first things that they got a bad reputation for was they didn't want facial hair, and the mm -hmm. Europeans uh, like facial hair, especially the women, and uh, the uh, that was a joke. Pause. Nobody. Okay. <laughs> anyway. Uh, but they didn't like the facial hair, uh, and uh, they got a bad rep for that. And I think there was something else that went on there. That, and for a while, Disney Euro Disney was failing. I mean, you could go there and shoot a cannon through the place, and there was nobody there. But eventually, they persevered, and they got nice with everybody, and they learned that you treat Europeans differently than you treat Americans mm -hmm. or even the Chinese mm -hmm. or Japanese. Uh, and and uh, but uh, but at that time that was the first time I ever heard about the no facial hair policy. You know. Right, and and that did actually loosen up all over the place, and and Disneyland yeah. was, uh, if I'm if yeah. I'm remembering correctly, Disneyland was the last holdout because that's that's where Walt was, you know. Yeah. That's where he spent his time, and he was allowed to have the mustache because he was, you know. Walter Elias Disney. Yeah, yeah <laughs> but right. You follow his rules, though. Right. And and uh, but I I think it was 2002 that they actually did get rid of the uh, the facial hair policy at right. Disneyland itself, and it was the last one to go. Jason and Sabrina, how are you doing lately? Doing pretty good. Yourself? Awesome. We haven't heard from you in a while. Yeah, we call them once in a while on Fridays. You know, I was just listening. There was some sound. And if I turn on my mic, maybe you can hear it. Wait, you hear that? No. It's rain. It's raining really <laughs> hard outside right now. 
It wasn't earlier, but it is now. Anyway, uh, uh, so uh, anyway, what have you guys been up to? You haven't, we haven't heard from you in a while. Just working. Going to be going on vacation next week. Where are you going? Uh, Canada. Canada. Woo! Hey, Jim. Oh, I, wouldn't go, I wouldn't go there. <laughs> <laughs> so warm. It's so warm and tropical. So where in Canada? Uh, it's by the Georgian Bay called Collingwood. Do you know that, uh, Jim? No, that's in the east, so that's not really Canada, so that's okay. Ontario. <laughs> <laughs> It's Ontario. Do you ever get this, Jim, when you're uh, like come down to the United States and you say I'm from Revelstoke, British Columbia, and after they say, well, where's that? And you tell them, is the next thing out of the word mouths, do you know so and so? Oh, yeah. You know, the best one I was, used to get that uh, from being from uh, San Francisco. You're from San Francisco. Do you know so and so? Uh -huh. Yeah. No, the best one I ever got was uh, uh, people found out I was from Canada and uh, they were very nice. I, I was on some vacation and they said, um, uh, oh, we've been to Canada. And I said, oh, yeah, really? What part of Canada did you go to? Uh, they said, downtown. <laughs> <laughs> which, which I figured out was somewhere in, uh, uh, somewhere in Winnipeg. I figured downtown was. Uh, well, uh, so, yeah. This one Miranda will get. Uh, uh, people, when you're in California and uh, you mention, uh, 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 have, you ever, have, you, have you ever been in another country? And they went, well, I went to Mexico. Where in Mexico? And they say Tijuana. Mm -hmm. Well, Tijuana really isn't Mexico. Yeah. So. What? Yeah. what? No, it isn't. <laughs> it's uh, it's called Lower California, Baja California. It's still it's, Mexico. It's part of Mexico, but it's not exactly. I, or people who say, I say, have, have you ever been outside the United States? Yeah, I went to Hawaii. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> you, know, you, you get that one. I love the Jeopardy question about two countries that are connected to the United States that are south of the United States. Nobody ever guesses that Canada is actually south of part of the United States. Yeah, but it, it, wait a minute. I'm trying to think how that works. Well, <laughs> mm -hmm. you, yeah, I'd have to look at a map, but I think you're, you're right, actually. It's oh, right yeah, over it's here. It's called. On it's the not connected called Alaska. Alaska. Michigan. It's called Detroit. what? Yeah. It's called oh, it's Alaska. Because of Alaska. Because, yes, because of Alaska. Yes. <laughs> no. Yes. You see. But then again, I don't I prefer not to think of Alaska as part of the United States. Um right, my girlfriend lives by Detroit, Canada, south of us. Wait, what 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 are you saying, Patrick? My girlfriend lived there. Your girlfriend lived there. Sarah, Sarah? Palin. Oh, <laughs> You're really hot for her, aren't you, Patrick? House. You're really hot for her, aren't you? Oh, hell yeah. And then <laughs> Albert said that she got some new show on, and I said I'm going to put that on my spank bank now and record it. <laughs> uh, I mean, what the hell? Well, that's all you can and, do. I mean, you note, can't. Let me just say this, Alec. The most famous person I ever met mm -hmm. and have had numerous conversations with and photographed with is Scott Walker. Oh, the the esteemed governor of your state. Or as correct. we like to call him in the Democratic Party, that asshole. Yep. That's correct, yes. Yes. And, and Isn't that what we call all Republicans? Well, except for Patrick. No. Now, Patrick's a Republican, but, you know. No, no, no. I mean, I, I meant crossover. the politicians, not, not, not the actual... Yeah, no, it, it, it's uh, it's uh, well, it's 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 Spanish for uh, for Republican. Yeah, asshole. Yeah, yeah poor Patrick. <laughs> His parents are Democrats, and they hate Star Wars. Yeah. yeah. It, yes, and they hate me sometimes too. Do so. they? How can you? How can anybody hate you? Yeah. I know. I'm so lovable and sweet. But come election time, <laughs> they they don't really like me. Well, I don't like you during Especially election when time Scott either. Walker but... won twice. Yeah. They, they just didn't talk to me for a day or two, so. You still think Scott Walker's good, right? Yes. And and your reasoning behind, uh, uh, look, uh, uh, Jason is like giving the thumbs down. You can do that again now. I've got you on a bigger screen here so he can see you. There we go. Why, why, why is Scott Walker? Come on, quickly do your Scott Walker uh, love fest thing here. Oh, come on. We, we, we've only got a few minutes. You don't want this crap. Oh, okay. No, I don't, actually. But... And, and, okay, and, and let me just lighten it up then. 
Then the other very famous person I met that nobody's ever really seen yeah. is Kenny Baker, the guy that was inside R2-D2 yeah. in all of the Star Wars movies. That, 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 that certainly qualifies. You wouldn't recognize him on site, although I would, actually. I, got a, I, got, I have a photograph with him. Um, oh, and, I've seen that, uh, yeah. It was, it was pretty cool meeting him and just chatting with him. So. Yeah. Did you put him in like a trash can so everybody would recognize him? <laughs> it, well, actually, when I when I was standing next to him, yeah. I was surprised at how short he was. Really? You know who was really tall? I had on uh, the guy who played Darth Vader. Not the voice. Yeah, David Prowse. David Prowse, uh, who a uh, big, big guy. Nice, sweet guy, too. Really sweet guy. Um mm -hmm. But uh, also, I had on. Uh, who else did I have on that day? There was um, there was a kid who was uh, appearing in uh, in one of the Star Wars films. There was three of them. I'm trying to remember who the third one was. I can't remember. It wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't. However, Kenny Baker. Uh, so um, that's that. Let me see here. You probably. I probably should let you go, right, Jim? So you can get ready for yeah, your show. Yeah, oh, I gotta go do some stuff. Yeah, he's got about five minutes or four minutes till he goes on the air. Yeah, you gotta drive over there. Yeah, he's gotta yeah, drive let's... over to the Log Broadcasting yeah. Center. Yeah. Okay, okay. So bye. Nice to see all of you. Okay. See, you should have just said you were at the Log Broadcasting Center when you've been talking <laughs> to us all night. But no, you have to drive over there. Yeah, no, I'm in my home at the moment, and I'm going to go drive there. Oh, okay. You have a okay, microphone that sounds exactly the same yeah, way, too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have two of them. Oh, wait a minute. I accidentally <laughs> hung up on Josh. I accidentally hung up on Josh. Wait a minute. Let me call Josh again here. I had to call. Okay, Josh. I'm sorry. I called. I hung up on Josh. Uh, Josh, are you there? Um uh, there we go. There we go. Sorry, Josh. Right. I hung up on you by mistake. I meant it meant to get rid of uh, Rebel Stoke Jim. Um, but this has uh, been uh, kind of fun tonight. We still got about uh, about three minutes left here. Uh, so uh, I want to go around the group. First of all, Rob, any any things you want to uh, impart to the group? Uh, I would just mention something to Miranda. Um, yeah. Have you ever seen the, the TV show The Americans on FX? Yes. No, but I really do want to watch it. Uh, it's a, tr I, I it's really a great do show. Like I love it. Would you, would you believe they show well, it? That's you, what I was leading to. Has should. anybody ever said that? Because you know, I'm sitting here thinking you look familiar, and you remind me of Carrie Russell. Oh. Yes. You would not be the first person to tell me that. I don't see it myself, <laughs> but I appreciate it every single time I hear it. Serena, bring well, yeah, doing a thumbs up. Beautiful. You know, the thing is, Last year, they shot an episode of the um, of the uh, Americans uh, in this apartment building, in the basement. Oh wow! They supposedly, I think, were keeping kidnapping somebody in a basement or something. They're yeah. always kidnapping somebody in a basement. Well, that so. was that, that was that was our basement. I'm afraid to live there. I tried. To, I've tried to get into that show, but I haven't been able to really get into it. Oh. Uh, you know. I know. I know. I know. But I've, I'm watching so many other things, and uh, now I'm into the show The Hundred, and then I uh, I watch The Arrow every week. Mm -hmm. Are you watching these two, Miranda? Isn't The Arrow? Uh, I haven't started watching The Hundred yet, but I do watch Arrow every it, week. It, isn't Arrow a good show? I love it. Yeah, I, I was a huge fan of Smallville, and that's how how I oh, ended up getting such into a, it. Such a good show. And then we're watching Game of Thrones Sunday night, and we're watching Vikings too. Anybody watching Vikings? Yeah, good show. Dude, I'm good trying to show. grow my hair out like the dude. <laughs> yeah, but then you also got to cut it on the side. It looks like everybody there has a bad barber and never takes a bath. You know what it is? It's a an ancient version of Sons of Anarchy is what yeah. it really is. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, hey, that's about it. We've run out of time. I got to get out of here so that Jim can get in here. Miranda, thank you. Please call again, and let's talk also about maybe having you do something here, okay? Uh, okay. Sabrina right. and Jason, Thank you. always good to hear from you guys. Rob, we'll see you this weekend as you host all those uh, brilliant uh, uh, Rewind programs you've been doing. David, um, uh, congratulations on not eating the cat this evening by accident. <laughs> Josh Wheeler, I hope the Reds just do wonderful, important stuff for you. Uh, Mark, always a pleasure. Love having you here. And you're one of the regular cast of characters along with Josh and Patrick and 
David's on most of the time too now. And uh, Rob uh, thank you. And, and Josh, thank you as well. We will hope and pray the Reds do better so that you're not depressed the next time you come online. Anyway, thanks to all of you. It's been wonderful Bye -bye. having you here. And uh, it's also been good having you here. Let me see if I can actually turn to my camera uh, for the people watching the video. Last time I did it, the whole thing froze, and uh, that was it. But let's see what happens.